although I have walked, where Jesus walked, a number of times, how much more could I have known if I could have spent time there when Jesus and the apostles walked and taught, observing the villages, the people, and especially the women who lived in Galilee and Judea, in Philippi and Ephesus. Although I can't do that, let me share a little of what I have found as a background for what will come next. We have pieces of history, some of which we must read between the lines, as we try to guess how women lived and fought in those days. We have old fragments of ancient papyrus and idealized funerary inscriptions. The extant historical and literary sources of that day seldom mention women at all. Or if they did, they gave caricatures of them as silly or superstitious and always ranked them inferior to men. Philo, for example, an often cited first century Jewish author, reported, women are best suited to the indoor life, which never strays from the house. She should not show herself off like a vagrant in the street before the eyes of other men. Fortunately, we have new information that has expanded this once very narrow view of female possibilities. In a just published book entitled Women in the New Testament World, Susan Hyland brings together recent decades of scholarship, which affirm that, well, yes, women at this time were generally seen as subservient and inferior to men and are little represented in written history there is more evidence now that women did nonetheless participate to a greater extent in their economic, social, and political environments than we had previously thought. She offers cautions about drawing sweeping conclusions about women's isolation from authors such as Philo of Alexandria or Josephus, who paint dismal pictures of women's roles. She also counsels restraint in making assumptions about the typical social constructs of their day, because the actual practice may differ from the stated rule, and what was in the provinces may be quite different from the urban areas. Here are some important caveats from Hyland's impressive work. While it is true social ranks governed nearly everything, political or economic, and did rank women beneath men, there is evidence that there were many layers of social possibilities. Young people deferred to elders, slaves to their masters, or to a freed or freeborn person, the poor to the wealthy. Thus, a young, ordinary man would defer to a woman who was older and wealthier. A male slave could defer to any free woman. Many Roman and Jewish women were very wealthy and women everywhere could own property, even though even large estates. And although her husband could benefit from the use of his wife's property, he could not sell it. And upon his death or a, uh, or a divorce, it would be <coughs> in her hands, the, the hands of his wife. At times, women exercised leadership, held offices, and had influence in their communities and in political situations as well as their households. They sometimes petitioned successfully for change. They were not always subordinate to all men in all situations. Some women owned and managed slaves, servants, large households and family industries. Thus we see all women were not helpless or powerless. And a fine example of this we see in Luke chapter eight, verses one to three, that Certain women, including Mary Magdalene, Joanna, the wife of Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others, were with Jesus, as were the disciples, and ministered unto him of their substance. In Acts 16, we read of Lydia, a seller of purple dye. This is a very expensive product. Lydia was perhaps a wealthy widow. She converted to Christianity along with all her household. 
and she subsequently hosted Paul, perhaps the entire congregation at Philippi. Now the baptism of slaves or servants and other members of the household along with their masters was a common occurrence. Think of what I said about the importance of social ranks. And now let's imagine the difficulty of all these recent converts coming together in an egalitarian Christian congregation as described in Galatians 3, 28, where all, all were deemed equal before God, men and women, slave and free. Living up to these, ideal, these ideals could make for very tricky social situations, requiring all to make delicate accommodations. I remember a conversation in France some years ago where the non-member daughter of a highly respected older scholar who had converted to the church bristled that members in the congregation whom she considered the social inferiors to her father spoke to him using the familiar informal verb form which all the members used. The father didn't mind. It demonstrated his embrace of the heartfelt greeting brother and sister. Now, with this information, we are better prepared to appreciate the complexity of the community that was home to Jesus and the women of the New Testament. Yes, a few women did exercise power, but most did not. And some people held the same views that Philo and Josephus did, although not everyone. With this in mind, Let's think how truly astonishing it would have been to hear Jesus' unique gospel message and witness his completely inclusive attitude toward all women, and especially toward those most rejected by society. In addition to his message stand remarkable accounts of the reaction of a few specific women that we are told about who courageously, inspired by their recognition of the identity of Jesus of Nazareth, responded in unique ways. These women will now be the focus of my remarks. Three stand out to me as particularly noteworthy examples because of, number one, their reported actual conversations with Jesus Christ, and two, their reactions to these, con to these <coughs> conversations. For the Gospel writers, each of these women served as an important conduit of a unique aspect of the gospel message. So number three, which was selected and highlighted to be remembered and imitated as early Christianity took root. These three women were able to see what so many others couldn't. Paul was hidden in plain sight that Jesus really was the long-awaited Messiah the savior of the world, walking in their midst with a power to change them and those who followed their example. My first woman's story was so impressive that Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record the details, although none tell us her name. Maybe she slipped away too quickly to give it. We only know her by her ailment, an issue of blood for 12 long years. She had suffered many things of many physicians and had only grown worse. She was impoverished, having spent her, all her living seeking a cure. Because she comes alone, she may have been alone, unlike the paralytic man whose friends came and hoisted him up on the roof. Even more than that, she was shunned. Jewish law declared her impure because of her revolting blood malady. Anyone touching her, became impure as well. She would have been forbidden to enter the temple court of the women or any synagogue, little better than a leper in her society. It is hard to imagine a more bereft person. And yet, she had indomitable faith and courage, and she persisted actively searching for an answer over many years, spending all she had. And when she learned of Jesus, Somehow she was able to get to where he was and to press through the crowd to the very front. The image you see comes from the Koran Church just outside Istanbul, 
It's about the fourth century and is one of the earliest mosaics of Christianity that we have. Had this woman heard of Jesus' bold announcement of his identity in the synagogue or his many miracles as he traveled to every city and village, as Luke tells us in 8, chapter 1? Matthew and Mark tell us specifically that she recognized that Jesus was greater than any physician because they quote her as saying within herself, if I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. She believed that Jesus was the promised Messiah, the Holy One of Israel, one so holy <coughs> that he part holiness and purity to others. Kent Brown, in his New Testament commentary, suggests this is the reason she reached for the border of his garment, or the tassels, which had special holiness significance. Her faith even exceeded that of the disciples who said, how could you possibly discern that someone touched you in this crowd? But she knew all she had to do was touch. When she came forward, trembling and hesitant, admitting for all that she was, in fact, completely healed of this distressing chronic infirmity, Jesus blessed her with more than a cure. He called her daughter. Daughter. And he proclaimed to all present, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. In announcing her wholeness, he restored her to society, cured, acceptable in all places, healed physically, religiously, and socially, no longer shunned. And by calling her daughter, he allowed her and all of us an eschatological glimpse into a world beyond mortal rank and status as a daughter, an honored place in the heavenly family loved. To this, Jesus added, thy faith hath made thee whole, acknowledging her contribution to this miracle. No wonder this story is beloved and much illustrated in art, poetry, and song. Jesus had announced he would bring healing, and then he performed visible acts, paralytics who picked up their bed and walked. But with her, he demonstrated invisible healing for those with determined faith in him, that love, acceptance, and healing were available for those who seek it, acknowledging his power. Early Christians embraced this example and Christ's admonition to go in faith and do likewise in caring for the sick and those who were rejected by society. Sociologist Rodney Stark has said, pagan and Christian writers are unanimous not only that Christian scripture stress love and charity as the central duties of faith, but they actually did this. These practices were sustained in everyday behavior. He quotes Tertullian, who said, it is our care of the helpless, our practice of loving kindness, that brands us in the eyes of our opponents. Only look, they say, look how they love one another. And then Stark goes on to give interesting examples of this care and its effect. He shows that the numbers of Christian followers grew exponentially, partly because the Christians actually did care for one another, especially during epidemics, as compared to the Romans, who typically quickly abandoned even family members. And care as simple as food and water vastly increased the survival rates of the ill. And then the immunized Christians could minister like angels among the sick and the dying. And those survivors, especially those whose friends and family had abandoned them, quickly joined the new communities of faithful caregivers. And they rejected their previous practices of abandoning or exposing infant daughters or abortions, both of which were decimating the female birth rates or survival rates. Most Christians also married and stayed faithful with increased birth rates. And all of this demographically contributes to their exponential growth to become, as Rodney Stark says, 
the dominant religious force in Western world in just a few centuries. Do we think of Alma 37? By small and simple things <coughs> are great things we got to pass. Now the painting on this slide occupies the entire wall. It's about as long as these two big sections here of a newly built church at the synagogue at the ruins of the archaeological uh, the archaeological ruins of the synagogue in Magdala, the village traditionally of Mary Magdalene. The, the synagogue was only discovered in 2009 and dates to the first century. Now this new church honors the women of the Old and the New Testaments and their stories. As you can see, Christ's response to the woman who reached out to him resonates still today, particularly with women as a vivid example of his, his loving acceptance to all who find themselves in distress. My next woman is a story that I will begin. Uh, Jorge Coco has beautifully illustrated this example, which comes from the Gospel of John. Now, two encounters are recorded in John, two very different seekers who question Christ. The first one is a man who comes at night, and John calls him a learned leader of the Jews. He came to ask Jesus, who are you? And from whence is your power? And he left, still wondering. Jesus said to him, if I told you earthly things and you didn't believe, how could you believe me if I told you of heavenly things? Nicodemus could not see beyond the material. Or maybe he was too afraid of facing the Sanhedrin. But he did fail to lead any of his people to the truth. In vivid contrast, Jesus next tells, immediately following, another encounter. And it couldn't be more opposite. In broad daylight, with a woman, a Samaritan woman, without prestige, power, or wealth. And yet, she too is a student of the scriptures, one who is searching and one who shows herself ready to listen, believe, and to lead. Christ approaches her. Give me to drink. You can see how Coco has shown how Christ reaches through the barrier between them. She is understandably wary, but not timid. Why would you, a Jew, speak to me, a Samaritan? And a woman, she doesn't say, but she means that as well. And Christ says to her, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is that says to you, give me to drink, you would have asked of him, and he would have given you living water. Her interest is piqued. She understands the metaphor. <coughs> she is eager for any gift from God, whatever the unusual appearance of the person offering it. Not like Nicodemus. The woman is intrigued. Who is this man? She challenges him, but in a way that already acknowledges his authority. Sir, are you greater than Jacob? He answered, whoever drinks of this water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but it shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Without hesitation, she accepts fully Give me this water. To which Jesus replies, go and get your husband. This enigmatic response may imply that a couple can receive together what Jesus offers that will bring everlasting life. And accordingly, encouraging her to alter her current status. He says she's had five husbands. But we don't know what that means. It might not necessarily, in her world, indicate any fault of hers. Even though the present situation, the one that she is with now is not her husband, might not be one in which she had any control. We will read later, she seems to have a high credibility in her village. And that is all we know. But she will then reveal an intense spiritual longing Quote, I can see you are a prophet. Tell me where I should worship the true God, Mount Gerasim or Jerusalem. End of quote. 
The Jews and the Samaritans were in deep conflict over this, and obviously she is very concerned to do what is right. At his authoritative answer, the woman boldly suggests, I know the Messiah is to come, which is called Christ. In other words, I'm looking for the Messiah. Could you be? Are you he? And Jesus then rewards her spiritual quest and her courageous question, clearly revealing himself to her as he has not done to anyone before. I that speak to thee am he. And what does she do? She leaves her pot, just like the disciples leave their nets, and she runs to spread the word. Come, see, is this not the Christ? And because of her words, many people in the village come out to hear, and they believed that Jesus was the promised prophet. She accepts completely, shares without reserve, and believes and is responsible for the spreading of the gospel message. There's another reason she was given that revelation. Contrast this again with Nicodemus, the leader of the Jews, who holds back, cannot admit that Jesus could be the Christ, won't defend him, and thus loses the prize of eternal life. Jesus promised to provide the living water, and yet it is the woman who has the pot to draw it. It is she who will bring the water to her village, saving them spiritually. And we have the quote from the villagers who say, we heard him ourselves, and we know indeed this is the Christ, the savior of the world. The pattern of this strong, seeking woman who will lead her friends and family to Christ will be repeated again and again throughout early and later Christianity. Again, from the sociologist Rodney Stark, who says, quote, the ancient sources and modern historians agree the primary con uh, conversion to Christianity was more prevalent among females than among males. And he quotes again Henry Chadwick, as Christianity seems to have been especially successful among men, it was often through the wives that it penetrated the upper classes of society and the servants and nurses as well. What could this woman at the well teach us today who are also seeking? First, that Jesus will respond to those who sincerely ask for his living water, but it's up to us. Can we put aside our dependence on the material and the physical, and as she did, and look and see spiritually and understand what the Savior has to teach us of heavenly things? And can we embrace and share as enthusiastically as she, her story and his? Is this not the Christ? Now, our third woman is unique in all of Scripture. The only woman specifically named whom Jesus loved. John 11 tells us, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Martha? Really? Really? That much troubled Martha with whom all women I readily identified? The one who needed to learn to put aside her household cares and choose the better part? Actually, it is possible in the text to see that that event found at the end of Luke chapter 10 could have occurred after the dinner as well as before. And then what Jesus asks of her is much more understandable. The dishes can and should wait. And the rest of the story told shows us that Martha really did sit and listen and learn. And Luke's message highlights again the choice between material distractions and choosing, as is the theme of our conference, the better part. John's strong affirmation of Jesus' love for this family is given a second witness, as bystanders observed of Lazarus, behold how Jesus loved him. Why was it that Jesus so loved this family in Bethany? What do we know about Martha? For 
one thing, it is her house. It is Martha's house. And with no husband named, she is most likely a widow, caring for both her brother Lazarus and her sister Mary. Perhaps with a house large enough to accommodate Jesus and at least some of his disciples, Martha may well have been very wealthy, perhaps even a prominent resident, because important friends come from Jerusalem to mourn Lazarus' death. New Testament scholar Philip Essler and others have suggested that she might be in the lucrative perfume trade, since Mary has access to a quantity of expensive anointing oil, and Bethany is right on the road to Jericho, where such oil and fragrance could be obtained. What we do know is she quite literally follows Jesus' injunction to feed my sheep, for she hosts and provides meals, many meals, perhaps for him and maybe many others. Martha and Jesus appear to be close friends, very comfortable, so much so that Jesus could so kindly correct her. Martha, Martha. As we read in the last days of his life of the rejection that Jesus suffers, this family serves as an important contrast. They give him their full acceptance, devoted love and service. And yet, for all their apparent familiarity, Martha will always address Jesus as Lord, fully acknowledging his divine authority. As was so beautifully told last night, the strength of her faith in him does not waver in the face of the worst tragedy, the death of her beloved Lazarus. She could have been justified in thinking that her special rank and her wealth and her service would have earned her consideration and privileges. And yet she will resolutely declare before the raising of Lazarus, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, who should come into the world. As was told to us last night, this wonderful testimony stands as the bookend with Peter's testimony, our two disciples who can affirm this. The raising of Lazarus was Jesus' most astonishing miracle, showing his power over death. Early Christians saw in the raising of Lazarus a symbol of their faith, that their loved ones could also someday rise again, and not just to judgment, which some Jews believed, but to eternal life. So when Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life, he believed, he that believeth in me Though he were dead, yet shall he live. And the coming of Lazarus, the coming forth of Lazarus, is the second most utilized image in the early Christian catacombs and on the sarcophagi. And it shows their total faith in this message. This next image is the one, one of the oldest Christian artifacts in the Vatican. And it's an etching on glass with gold, uh, gold leaf. Shortly after the raising of Lazarus, Jesus will speak of going to his father's house, not to a kingdom in heaven, but to a house with places for all. Does he love Martha's house because it represents on earth a place where he consistently found safety, peace, acceptance, and love? Scholar Philip Essler sees a pattern in John's Gospel in which, quote, the household serves a present as a present and future model for relationships between followers and with Jesus and the Father. It reflects the reality of Christian worship being located in households, as well as, quote, a conscious preference for the kind of relationships of households and the model of community. And we know that it was well into the second century Christians were still meeting in private homes where they experienced the benefits of community that tried to live up to Martha's home and her example. Through their care of the sick, they were cared for themselves. Through their aid to the less fortunate, they were helped when things turned down. And by welcoming all ranks in loving kindness, they too felt loved and protected. New Testament scholar Thomas Gombas explains, in the pagan world, or we might even say in our world today, 
Those in positions of power, quote, manipulate, dominate, and exploit weaker ones in order to increase in social status and honor, end of quote. Instead, Gallus notes that Paul describes for the Ephesians, quote, a new order, one under God, governed by God, and in the pattern of love demonstrated by Jesus Christ, where each and every person has dignity and stewardship, and those who have authority or power are to use it for the good protection and nurture of those who are subordinate. Paul teaches all members of this new household of God, male or female, to think eschatologically, to do good, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, he shall receive of the Lord. Isn't Martha an example of this most important teaching as she witnessed the coming forth of her beloved brother, the symbol of us all, of the ultimate reward, a promised reunion with departed loved ones. This is our ultimate reward for faith in Christ. As Sister Hubakes told us, in her declaration of Christ's divinity, Martha's witness stands next to that of Peter. And the gospel has given us her story of generous and selfless service, but most importantly of all, John gives us her very words, her quote, which endure as a crucial testimony of a woman who knew Jesus personally and well and loved him deeply. Jesus trusted her, and so can we, and lean on her words and testimony. I am grateful to these three exemplary women women and many others we read about in the New Testament for their strength, their faith and courage, and their loving discipleship. Their memorable stories, memorable stories can inspire and teach us as we confront our own challenges and navigate the complexities of our world as we today strive to respond to Christ's message to love and serve as they did. And there is much for us still to learn and for artists to portray. Jeannie and I have been honored for many years and have been fascinated with the Greek texts and artistic renditions of the parables of Jesus. Especially the Good Samaritan has been portrayed by artists over centuries, as in early illuminated Greek New Testament manuscripts, this one from Florence, in stained glass windows, France, this one from Chart, as well as on the back of icon screens such as this one, in the Greek Orthodox Chapel at St. Catherine's Monastery in Sinai. Or recently we found this one on the ceiling of an Eastern Orthodox Church in Tarnovo, Bulgaria. 
Particularly interesting is the way in which the Good Samaritan is almost universally understood in early Christianity as an allegory of the plan of salvation, as the label on the picture here in this room indicates. Let me read you the full quote from Oregon, 2nd century AD, said that he learned this particular interpretation from the elders, the old members of the church. He always used that language to describe, describe the apostles or people who had been taught by them. So this interpretation was widely understood throughout earliest Christianity. It reads, the man who was going down is Adam, Jerusalem is paradise, and Jericho is the world. The priest is the law, the Levite is the prophets, and the Samaritan is Christ. The wounds are disobedience, the beast is the Lord's body. The pandokion, that is the way station, which accepts all pan, who wish to enter is the church. And further, the two coins mean the father and the son. The manager of the stable is the head of the church to whom its care has been entrusted. And the fact that the Samaritan promises he will return represents the Savior's second coming. This interesting interpretation of the Good Samaritan led us to wonder how many other parables might relate to what Latter-day Saints in the Book of Mormon call the plan of salvation. It soon dawned on us that just as Jesus had taught the master plan of salvation in the parable of the Good Samaritan, he taught individual principles of that great plan in all the rest of his signature series of parables. Jeannie and I first connected with Coco when he spoke to the BYU Studies Academy in 2016, almost four years ago. His presentation, along with a premier exhibit of his paintings on the life of Christ, many of which are also in this room, led Herman to, to, to Herman de Toy's essay about Coco's life and work in BYU Studies Quarterly. And some of that is also repeated in our book. Jeannie and I were both drawn immediately to Coco's sacrocubist style, and we sensed how his artistic ab abstractions could work especially well with each of Jesus' parables, which are also abstractions. And how the plan of salvation was like the picture on the puzzle box in putting the parable pieces together as one great coherent whole. Our point of departure was the question that the apostles once asked Jesus, namely, why do you speak in parables? He answered, many people will understand parts of what I'm saying, but you especially will really understand because to you, he said, is given the mystery of the kingdom of heaven, according to Mark, and even the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, according to Matthew. So those disciples knew something, and several parts of that thing, that acted for them as the key to understanding Jesus' parables. The Apostle Paul then makes it clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 what that key was. That mystery, he said, was essentially the plan that God foreordained from the foundation of the world, before the world was. Indeed, in explaining how to understand the parable of the talents, Joseph Smith had advised, the great plan of salvation is a theme which ought to occupy our strict attention. And that advice applies equally to all of Jesus' parables. Because first and foremost in the plan of salvation is the principle of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, it is easy to see that Jesus actually painted himself often into the parables by asking, where is Jesus in each parable? We rarely have trouble finding him. He can be the rescuing Samaritan, the planting gardener, the foundational rock, the good shepherd, the Lord who forgives astronomical debts, or the son of the Lord of the vineyard, as well as the bridegroom, whom the ten bridesmaids await. Joseph Smith gave a second useful interpretive key, which was 
To understand a parable, ask what question drew the parable out. In the case of the Good Samaritan, people most often think of the lawyer's second question, who is my neighbor? But the first question that the, the lawyer asked was, what must I do to obtain eternal life? Or we might say, in other words, tell me the plan of salvation. And thus, in this story, Coco has correctly placed Christ's atonement in the Garden of Gethsemane directly in the victim's line of vision, above and behind the life-saving works of the Samaritan. This is a marvelous artistic connecting of those two scenes of rescue. In addition, in our book, we ask a third question of every hero. Who am I in this story? Think back to the parable of the Good Samaritan. Listeners may and probably should identify with the man who went down. We all came down from a holy place. We all have fallen among robbers. Or, as Vincent van Gogh, nearing his death, pathetically hoped, a savior would come to rescue him. Van Gogh's death mask profile matches exactly the profile of the face of the wounded man being rescued this painting. But we can also see ourselves as one of the robbers. Maybe we're beating up on people. Or as the Levite who couldn't help because he lacked the power to redeem and save. Or perhaps are we all innkeepers entrusted with the care and healing of people brought to us. But most of all, as this painting shows, we should see ourselves as the Samaritan. Or didn't Jesus say, speaking of him, go and do thou likewise. So we find it striking that all people everywhere identify so naturally with the parables of Jesus. Just as the plan of salvation is for every person in God's creation, so women, men, young women, sons, Houses, marriage feasts, and families populate the parables of Jesus. This openness to women is striking. Perhaps this very effective feature of these memorable teachings explains best how and why women so solidly embrace Jesus' proclamation of the gospel as Jeannie has covered. For, as we will see, so many of the parables are gender inclusive. Several parables involve and extol women as role models. None of the parables demean women. The so-called parable, the so-called parable sermon in Matthew chapter 13 includes seven parables covering the plan of salvation from the beginning to the final judgment as a microcosm. The first parable in this sequence goes by many names. It can be called the parable of the sower, the parable of the soils, or the parable of the seeds. And here you see in this picture, as in the plan of salvation, life-bearing spirits or seeds coming down upon the earth. Such spirits Coco has represented by seeds and notice some in the palm of the Lord's hand. As was part of the Father's plan, these seeds will find themselves in various circumstances. All these seeds are exposed to trials and troubles, scorching sun, noxious weeds, and birds of prey. Some will fall upon good soil, conducive of growth, while others will be hampered in their growing, as is pictured here. The existence of these differences is not an unexpected aberration but an integral part of the plan. Both female and male listeners can relate equally to this gender-inclusive portrayal of mortality, coming down, growing, bearing fruit, 30, 60, and some even 100 fold. And speaking of everyone coming down to this earth, another parable 
takes us back to the primordial council. I call it the parable of the willing and unwilling two sons. This parable about a certain man who had two sons was given by Jesus in response to the chief priest's two questions. By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you that authority? In answer, Jesus tells how the father asked his first son to go down and labor in the vineyard this day. The original Greek makes it clear that the first son did not say, I will not go, but I will it not, or it is not my will. Yet he reconciled himself to the will of the father, and he went for it thus with power and authority. The other son, of course, did not. Coco's depiction focuses on the decisive moment when the father extended his assuring and determined hands to his first son, who places his hands submissively over his heart. Meanwhile, the other son, Lucifer, is exiting on the margins. This polar opposition represents the principle of opposition in all things, which affects everyone applies everywhere, in all things, even in family relationships and abroad. The question, why must there be an opposition in this world, is answered by the next parable, the wheat and the tares. Not focusing on the point that an enemy had sown the tares while man slept, as other artists have tended to do, Coco shows the Lord directing his servant to let the two grow together a season, for uprooting the tares will damage the wheat. This no doubt teaches about the anticipated great apostasy, how there will be good wheat out there in the world amidst the tares, and how the living wheat, ready for harvest, will eventually become distinguishable from the empty tare. But it also shows that both the wheat and the tares represent what we live with as well. And notice that the wheat and the tares are gender indistinguishable subjects. Speaking to all, men and women, this symbolizes our need to produce good fruit and not have deleterious effects on others in preparation for the coming final harvest or judgment. The next parable in Matthew 13 is the parable of the mustard seed. We see it as teaching many things about the principle of growth and progression. As this painting sequentially illustrates growing in three stages from left to right, a tiny seed is carefully planted and tended. It will grow to be a large mustard plant, which will become a home to purify birds of the heaven. Joseph Smith saw in this parable the antidote to the apostasy with the Book of Mormon becoming the seed that will come up out of the ground to safely harbor the birds, the families, that come as couples and choose to build their holy nests, literally <coughs> to the tabernacle, in its branches, to hatch and feed their babies. Coco's abstract approach allows all viewers, men and women, to understand this narrative relative to their own needs and contexts. Next, the plan and given at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, requires every person to choose the two ways, either the straight and narrow or the wide and easy. This principle is also universally applicable, meaning meaningful individual choice coupled with consequences and accountability is the enabling power that makes life in this mortal existence eternally valuable for everyone. Principles of the two ways are found in many parts of scripture, and Coco's geometric design certainly accentuates the crux of that particular turning point. The plan of salvation also makes it clear that there are consequences and accountability. Coco studiously infuses here specific textual details into this image. Here the painting of the rock and the sand accentuates the strength of the temple house or family home built upon a perfectly flat and solid foundation. In counterpoint, of course, the storm and its violence indicates the magnitude of the collapse of a home built on an unstable foundation. 
The shepherd parables teach that those who choose the covenant path can, choose, can trust in the protection of the Lord. He presents himself as the good shepherd who calls to his sheep and cares for them. The good shepherd rescues and protects his sheep, his lambs, his rams, and his ewes. All are equally defenseless, have poor vision, cannot find their way home, but mysteriously they can recognize the unique call of their shepherd and follow him. The symbol of the sheep is powerful for a reader who understands how much sheep need each other. Their only security really comes from being close to the shepherd and also being a member of a flock. The images of a sheepfold is warmly inclusive. The lone sheep is truly lost. And as was promised in the pre-mortal council, our shepherd, Jesus Christ, promised to give his life to overcome death and engage all to see how. Much the Father loves all his children and wants them to regain his presence. The parables also just dramatically portray the unimaginable great joy that comes when a single sheep returns, but also Notice how a woman is particularly used to show the joy of finding her lost coin. A precious piece of her dowry, perhaps. She calls her friends, others, to join and rejoice with her. Shared joy is an integral part of the Father's gender-inclusive plan. For the song of redeeming love is not a solo, and heaven is other people. But unlike the lost sheep and the lost coin, who did nothing to become found, humans who have wandered off must come to their senses, repent, and return of their own free will. While the Father watches for their return and celebrates their homecoming, as this poignant parable shows, we have here another domestic setting. And here I would like to also suggest that there must have been a mother there who was supervising the preparations for the homecoming feast for the one who had been lost. Coco's portrayal beautifully captures the many steps of this ungendered universal process of remorse, rethinking, confessing, reconciling. Implements used by women are also featured in several of the parables little clay lamp that can give light to the whole house, a small amount of yeast that can leaven an entire loaf, a few grains of salt that will season the whole pot, or the father's gold ring, perhaps the family wedding ring. These dignify the domestic realm, teaching the gospel is ironically, teaching the mysteries that by small things God will bring to pass great things. The parable of the importuning widow, who is desperate in her social condition, uses a woman to teach the mystery of prayer, that our persistent, insistent, even desperate prayers will eventually be answered. This faithful woman asked, sought, knocked, never giving up, endured to the end, and finally the judge recognized that her cause was just and answered her petition. The plan's mystery of forgiveness is taught by the case of the unforgiving debtor. This mysterious, this is mysterious beyond our imagination. How much the Father will forgive. But once we've been forgiven much, the plan requires that we must also forgive. In the Lord's Prayer, we plead, forgive us our trespasses or our debts, as, that is, and this is the mystery, to the extent that we forgive our debtors. In this parable, the debtor has been forgiven an enormous amount, but had refused to go out and forgive even a relatively small amount. And here Coco deftly flips the image of the forgiven man who turns around and refuses to forgive yielding an unforgettable image and a sober, sober, sober warning to us all. The parable of the pearl, which is one of them also here, 
teach us the mystery of sacrifice and consecration. To obtain the ultimate reward, all must be prepared to pay a heavy price. Like a merchant who seeks and finds a pearl of great price for sale and willingly sells all to buy it, this disciple willingly sells to obtain this pure white treasure. I like to think he was not buying it as an investment, but to give it to his eternal wife. <laughs> now, in no case does Jesus cast himself more as the main character than he does in the parable of the wicked tenants, which teaches the key mystery of the plan of salvation, namely the death of Jesus. You know the story. Of this drawing, our book states, the dying or dead householder's son is not shown racked with pain and suffering, as is often the case with artistic portrayals of the agony and passion of Jesus. Here he is stretched out with both arms extended out above his head, his final forsaken gesture. His face is in the dust, returning there as it were to atone for the fall of Adam, who was of the dust. The stylized thorn bush, faintly looming in the right-hand corner, is a potent portent of the crown that mockers will place on his head prior to his crucifixion. Even the chief priests, to whom Jesus told this parable, understood that Jesus spoke of them and also Yes, Jesus would die, but he would also return. We have this painting also here in the gallery. Women were the first of the witnesses of his resurrection, as is shown over here in the gallery. Women were also the focus in the parable of the ten bridesmaids, awaiting and recognizing the arrival of the bridegroom. This story honorably builds on Jewish wedding customs, it encourages all to watch. All must be prepared. And it reminds us that certain, certain things like personal testimonies cannot be shared. We cannot live on borrowed oil. We also must wear proper garments to enter the Lord's great wedding feast and simply knocking on the door saying, Lord, Lord, will not do. But do we know the will of the Father? Regarding the plan's mystery of divine judgment, there are several. The verdict will. The Lord's verdict will surprise many. Rather than just being a handout of rewards or punishments, there will first be a separation, as portrayed here in the parable of the wheat and the tares, which will be separated. There will then be a selection process, as we see in the parable of the great net, which pull in all kinds of creatures, and they will be separated not by gender, but by their degrees of righteousness and purpose. And third, as is taught in the parable of the talents, uh, there will be rewards given to those who have dealt with and magnified the gifts and possibilities that they have been given. Here we are especially invited to wonder who am I? Which one of these stewards am I like? I like the ones who developed vast resources that belong to the Lord and have been entrusted to us as his stewards? Or am I the overly critical steward who was dispensed with because he had thought poorly of his master and used that as an excuse to justify his indolence? And finally, the parable of the 11th hour laborers teaches us the absolute value that the Lord will keep every covenant that he has successively made with every single laborer in the earth's harvest field so wide. It also teaches us that no one should complain, of, complain to God about him being too generous to others, those who have arrived late, or those who have arrived early, so long as they have done what he has needed of them. And thus we see how Jesus' parables all teach step by step 
the essential plans, parts of the plan of salvation. And you might ask, so why does Jesus teach so many parables? And let me suggest the answer may be precisely because there are so many doctrines. There are so many parts of this plan. <coughs> and all of these doctrines are needed. As Elder Maxwell said, the doctrines of the church need each other as much as the people of the church need each other. Powerful doctrines bring happiness when fitly framed and woven together, but can bring misery if we spin them off separately. We dare not break the doctrines apart or specialize within them because we need them all. We need us all. And the Lord needs us and loves us. And we'll see that we can return according to his plan to regain his presence. This we gratefully testify of in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.